Welcome to this edition of Theological Journals at 1 o'clock, 1.30 on 25th of August, 2022. Anglican Theological Review, Dr. Higton on Receptivity of Jesus. For Tanner, the act of incarnation is not simply an act of God that takes place at the start of life. Jesus' life, God does not, as it were, establish the hypostatic union and let the human life constituted by that union run its course. The act of incarnation is the act by which God lays out the whole human life in the world. Quite the claim. A life that extends from conception to birth, to growth, to ministry, to death, to resurrection, to ascension and beyond. The whole life by the way that it is lived, by the whole course of what follows, exhibits the light, life, and love of God. The whole life shares God's life with the world. So we are getting the pantheistic theme. To put it another way, to describe the act of incarnation, you need the whole narrative of the Gospels. Incarnation is an act that unfolds over the whole story. Tanner is willing to speak of the deification of Jesus' humanity. God, that sounds like adoptionism. God's making this to be a human life utterly transparent in God's life, light and love. This deification, she's an adoptionist. She says, does not happen all at once, but over the course of Jesus' life and death. This is not at all because she meets Jesus becoming more divine over time. There's no gradual accession to divinity here. She does, so you just contradicted herself. She does not envisage some transition of Jesus into the hypostatic union from outside it. Rather, Jesus' whole life is a message from God in creaturely form. In a sinful world, this act of incarnation takes the form, moment by moment, of an overcoming of sin and its effects. Jesus does not overcome temptation until he is tempted, does not overcome death until he feels it, does not heal death until the word assumes death when Jesus dies. The act of incarnation is the act of God by which A human life is established in righteousness, a victory over sin and death. Tanner is not claiming that Jesus is first mired in unrighteousness and subsequently established in righteousness. This act of incarnation which establishes Jesus in righteousness is the very act by which his humanity is constituted. His humanity is therefore wholly at every moment established in righteousness and has no existence prior to or outside of righteousness. Nevertheless, the act by which Jesus' humanity is constituted and established in righteousness and the act which is brought into being in the midst of the world. To put this another way, we think of Gregory of Nazianzus saying that what is not assumed is healed. Put positively, what is assumed is healed. The assumption of humanity by the word is an act by which that humanity is healed and and an act by which every part of humanity is healed. Now we have universalism. We're used to the claim that every element that makes up a human person body, mind, will, soul, and so forth, must be healed. But in Tanner's picture, every temporal part is healed, too. Each episode, each development in Jesus' life as it occurs, united to God, established in righteousness, and healed. So adoptionism, pantheism, and universalism appear on the horizon. And now for Trinity Journal, a new article, 
by Elizabeth Backfish, Associate Professor of Old Testament at William Jessup University in Rockland, California. Repetition with variation in the dialogue and narrative of Judges. Repetition might not sound like the most riveting topic. Robert Alter calls it one of the most imposing barriers for modern readers. It might also not sound very congruent with the reticence and gapping that readers might come to expect in biblical narrative. Even so, it is widely unemployed and unappreciated. Hello, Dr. Bob. The trip was good. It was wonderful. A lot of things happened. A chance also to reflect on the lections that we're doing here. And I'm happy to report that there's no need to change the current trajectory of Old Testament, New Testament studies, systematic theology, church history. And then, of course, a, 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 maybe a widening consideration arising from that is how do we bring all of that? And we're in journals now. How do we bring that into 2022 to talk with our neighbor in the pew or with my brother or sister or my grandson? So I'm thinking a lot these days about the practical implications, the practical outworkings of that third or fourth stage in theological work. The first is retrieval, which is the academic side of exegesis, systematics, and church history, and then the conversation about it, and then where needed persuasion and engagement. So, for example, I'm thinking about the fact that Master Thomas Bilney was murdered on 25-ish August 1531 for his faith. How does, what does that mean for us today? He was an early English reformer at Cambridge. What does that say where we go to work or we go to our family life or we go to church life? And I have some ideas on that, but I'm using that to illustrate how I'm struggling to think, connect the past with the present. So everything went well. I'm, I got the cataracts done, but I still need the reading glasses. So otherwise, I'm long distance, mid-range distance. I'm 2020. So and good to hear from you. Glad we got a doctor in the house. <laughs> I love doctors. I come from a a medical family, two, two MDs, and I don't know, five or six nurses. And, um, so grow, my mother was a cardiology nurse for, I don't know, 40, 45 years. So I grew up on PQS waves and myocardial infarctions, and <laughs> atrial fibs, and, and a few hearts. I remember her telling at one time that some guy went into a cardiac arrest, and the doctor was doing his stuff. She said the worse it was getting the faster he was chewing his bubble gum, little things like that. Anyways, back to this on reiteration in the book of Judges. We're working on Judges in our morning lections, and we're up to Judges 13 with the visit of the angel of Jehovah to the house of Samson's mother and father. So we have this article in Trinity Journal from Trinity Episcopal Divinity School, where Dr. Uh, D.A. Carson teaches. Back to it. There are two types of repetition in the Hebrew Bible. Verbatim repetition, one might think of Isaiah 6, holy, 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 occurs where there is virtually no change between the repeated words or actions. It can serve to underscore structure, link sections of the text, highlight obedience, or simply add emphasis. Judges 13, 2 to 3 is an example of the latter, and that has to do with Samson. And his wife was barren, and she had not borne children. An angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Look now, you are barren and have not borne children. James Crenshaw calls it dirge-like 
repetition in his in the journal ZAW, the Samson saga. Another kind of repetition, and the subject of this article is varied repetition, where readers might expect to find verbatim repetition, but instead there's change. One classic example is when Eve, or Adam before her, adds to the original prohibition that in addition to not eating from the fruit of the tree, they were pro prohibited from even touching the tree. Such changes, either in repeated words or actions, serve a variety of narrative purposes, including emphasis, characterization, and narrative critique. As Alter explains, many of the psychological, moral, and dramatic complications of the biblical narrative are produced through this technique. And yet scholarly interest in the literary device has waned over previous decades. This article seeks to revive attention to this technique by exploring select cases of varied repetition in the Book of Judges and in their function within the narrative. These examples fall into four categories. Number one. The same character shows a variance between words and actions. Number two, the same character shows a variance between repeated words. Three, different characters show a variance between words and actions. Number four, different characters show a variance between different words. Before considering these examples in detail, a brief word on the methodology will follow and we will keep our eyes on the subject of variations and repetition as we work through the book of judges in the morning we turn to another article in anglican and episcopal history uh, this article is surveying the lambeth conferences over the years there's been 15 of them since 1868 my Math is right. We just recently had one with Justin Welby leading it in 2022 with little to nothing emerging other than the fact that they didn't throw the vast majority of Anglicans overboard. A great achievement for Justin. They're just not going to give, give in to the pansexualist agenda of the decadent and derelict Western Episcopalian churches. Hurrah for those Anglicans in South Africa and in Australia and in Indonesia, where about 80% of all worldwide Anglicans exist. They're not giving in to the baffle gabbers in the West. So to this article on the Lambeth Conferences as it pertains to international relations, the United Nations, the World Council of Churches, and the like, we pick up with that as their concern is with the nuclear and atomic age. Much of the discussion on disarmament crystallized in the single substantive resolution on modern warfare and Christian responsibility. This called for a comprehensive international disarmament treaty, which shall also provide for the progressive reduction of armed forces and conventional armaments to the minimum necessary for the maintenance of internal security and the fulfillment of the obligations of states to maintain peace and security in accordance with the United Nations Charter. The Lambeth Conference, and he doesn't identify which one of them, but this would be the ones occurring after World War II, 1958, 1968. The Lambeth Conference looked to the more effective use of and respect for the existing processes of international justice. And I do say processes 
because I was reared by a Canadian mother who took five years of Latin in high school and pronounced all the words pro instead of pra. So she would say process. Are you working on your project? And that kind of thing. <laughs> I was raised that way and I retain that. And I also say dynasty instead of dynasty. So that reflects uh, my Canadian, Anglican, and Presbyterian, and some Methodist background. In addition, the conference published a statement on peace, addressed not only to our fellow Christians, but to any who will listen to us. This statement said little that was distinctive. Indeed, a bland first draft was revised so that it should contain some Christian references and made clearer that the conference considered war to be evil. The resolutions of later Lambeth conferences, and it would be notable that by and large, the Lambeth resolutions and iterations did little to affect the 99.9% .9 of Episcopalians in the pew, but we, we soldier on. Resolutions issued by the first five Lambeth conferences of 1907, 1920, 1930, 1940, and 1958, excuse me, who were maintained by their successors but grew only slightly. During the 1968 Lambeth Conference, Soviet forces invaded Czechoslovakia. And I, as a youngster, remember the pictures in Time magazine of Soviet tanks, dry pictures of them driving up the main streets of Czechoslovakia and post-World War II fear of communist expansionism with its impulse for a bigger table and a bigger chunk of land and more taxes and more uh, natural goods such as minerals and agriculture and so forth. And then Archbishop Michael Ramsey, 1904 to 1988, led the bishops to Westminster Abbey to pray for the people of Czechoslovakia. There was no resolution, perhaps there would have been if there was an Anglican bishop of Prague. And we will pick that up again as we turn our attention to our next article in book reviews on the Episcopate, a volume entitled The Episcopate, The Role of Bishops in a Shared Future by Andrew Doyle, by the Church Publishing Company, 2022, and it's got a long lineage, long line of American bishops in this volume, including the heretic Katie Shorey, who opined that the Western Church grossly erred in talking about individual salvation, to which we force Katie Shorey, PhD in marine biology with a little wonder working 90 hour graduate degree from a decadent Episcopal seminary and who was by no means an exegete systematician or a church historian. Katie Shorey, the Episcopal heretic. I use that word advisedly and slowly. In his introduction, Doyle explains the four divisions into which the essays by the bishops fall. The first is a look backward at how Episcopalians have understood the ministry of bishops. The editor credits the first chapter by George Sumner, Bishop of Dallas, with beginning a conversation in the House of Bishops itself, entitled simply, On the Episcopate. It distinguishes between those aspects of Episcopal ministry which are non-negotiable, 
rooted as they are in the apostolic vocation of witnessing to the resurrection, which was denied by Bishop Bood of D.C., and other elements which are contextual, as in the case of the American Episcopal Church, insofar as it reflects the American setting and history. Richard Pritchard, Professor Emeritus of Virginia Theological Seminary, a church historian, and author of the well-known history of the Episcopal Church, gives a succinct overview of the many ways in which Episcopal ministry has changed since 1965, which he defines as a turning point in American society. Think sexual revolution, think Vietnam War, think race riots, think LBJ's Great Society pro Program for context, think communist expansionism, which we add here. The chapter by William Gregg, who was formerly Bishop of Eastern Oregon and now Professor of Theology at an AME Zion Seminary, and Parish Rector at the Diocese of North Carolina, urges the ministry of bishops to be done decently and in order, picking up that phrase from St. Paul in Corinthians, which Episcopalians like. They like decency and good order sort of like the way God runs his universe. And for Dr. Bob, who's our beloved friend here in medicine with all of the science and the chemistry that goes on in that brilliant production called A Human Being, decently and in good order for bishops, and affirms the value of such ministry arguing that order helps the church to do what it is called to do. William Franklin, assisting bishop of Long Island, uses the example of Pennsylvania's first bishop, William White, who presided at the Church Christ Church at 2nd and Market Street in Philadelphia. You can still go there. Benjamin Franklin attended there. George Washington was a vestryman there and attended there. Never took communion, however. And that was offered probably in those days on a quarterly basis. Uh, Benjamin Rush, John Jay attended there. I attended a service there once, but had been there a number of times. It's a very famous church. And Bishop William White was its rector for years and years. And his house, still standing as a historical museum now, it's closed for the present. And it's four or five streets over from this historic church. Prayer book, 1662 prayer book before the revolution. Same one that is used here for morning and evening prayer. A reflection of Dr. Thomas Cranmer brought into our times. Well, back to it, William white to describe the theory and practice of episcopal ministry might it be said that he was an evangelical uh, that would be claimed by evangelical episcopalians too bad you have to say evangelical and episcopalian because the prayer book is evangelical calling men and women to repentance unto life and saving faith in jesus christ as the only advocate and savior of any fallen human being. That's just built into uh, the old prayer book. White, Bishop White's early pioneering years and later life, in which he became conservative and even recalcitrant, Franklin prefers to see the change as a balancing the urgency of immediate needs with taking the long view associated with deepening and lengthened experience. Alan Shin, another writer, suffragan bishop of the Diocese of New York, concludes the historical section of the book entitled Episcopate, Race, and the Unity of the Church. It's important to note that the Northern Episcopalians allowed 
black and whites in the church, whereas in the South, they segregated them in congregation, the congregation. The Reformed Episcopalians, which was an offshoot in 1873, did the reverse in the South, in Charleston area. They established churches for black congregations, and anybody white or black could attend. So they were out ahead of their times in that day. Alan Shin contrasts the Episcopal Church's shameful avoidance of commenting on slavery both before and after the Civil War. We would add that the split also happened in the Presbyterian Church and the Northern Presbyterians, including Princeton Seminary, stood in the abolitionist stream, arguing for emancipation. A shameful avoidance of commentary in the Civil War, which enabled it to achieve unity with the southern diocese that had withdrawn during the war and the witness of Edward Denby, the first African-American bishop to serve in the Episcopal Church, a church located in New York City. As my, oh, no, I take that back in Philadelphia. I'm trying to think of the name of the church. I think it's St. Thomas staffed by a black rector and black throughout most of its history thereafter until more modern times when it is a polyethnic community. Beautiful building. Edward Demby, first African-American bishop to serve in the Episcopal Church. Demby was an unwavering advocate of true racial equity Necessary, Shin reminds us, for true communion, as opposed to the kind of unity achieved in the church by ignoring racial injustice. Looks like an interesting book to have. Turn our attention now to another book review, Trauma and Survival in the Contemporary Church, Historical Responses in the Anglican Tradition. Trauma is a very interesting psychiatric uh, issue. In this book, Trauma and Survival is edited by Jonathan Loft and Thomas Power, Cambridge Scholar Publishing, 2021. If one defines trauma as a shock or a wound causing substantial and lasting damage, one finds that trauma has seldom been absent from Christendom. In 2019, several Episcopal historical societies met in Toronto to devote an entire conference to various forms of trauma, as reflected over the past 150 years in former nations of the British Empire. The published papers are highly diverse, showing how widespread and wide-ranging the phenomena is. Not surprisingly, several articles deal with Canada. William Ockers describes the trauma involved in the effort of philanthropist and lawyer Samuel Hume Blake to terminate Anglican support for dysfunctional Indian residential and industrial schools. Uh, there's been quite, uh, even recently, long flappings over that problem. I didn't know it existed, but apparently it did in Indian areas. Norman Knowles, Knowles narrates the struggles of Deaconess Mary Tampkin to survive the predatory behavior of her superior. Henry Ward Cunningham of Halifax. World War I memorials are the subject of Glenn Lockwood's article, which stresses how plaques, cenotaphs, and stained glass windows sought to heal the sense of horror produced by the conflict. Gordon L. Heath relates how the weekly Canadian churchmen wrestled with pacifism in 1919 to 1939 amid the rise of predatory dictatorships. 
or 20th century, one of the great centuries exhibiting originals and actual sin. Church growth and decline is treated in David Harrison's chapter, which shows how once thriving parishes in suburban Toronto have been forced to amalgamate. W. David Neelands writes of his recovery from an evangelical and Pentecostalist cult to become an Anglican priest. And we will draw this section to a close and we will return, God willing, shortly with Table Talk, Standard Bearer, Bibliotheca, and Modern Reformation. Godspeed. If the Lord be for us, who can be against us? Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Godspeed.